Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We ask that you continue to establish your word in our lives. You say that heaven and earth will pass away, but your word will not pass away. And we thank you, Father, that your word continues to be alive in each one of our hearts and our lives. You can establish us in your word. We ask, O God, that even as we wait upon you, as we so desire, and we love your presence, and you continue to perform and do your perfect will in each heart and each life. We thank you, Father, that the world is at the feet of Jesus. And he has been given, Father God, by the ancient of days unto us, that it is time for the saints to possess the kingdom. The kingdom must arise. And we thank you, Father, it's always unto a prayer group. So unto, unto those who wait upon you. As we saw throughout the whole Bible, you put the whole Egyptian empire under one man who was tested and tried, and who was a man who walked with you, Joseph. And you have put the entire kingdom of Babylon under one man's influence, man of prayer, Daniel and his three friends. And you have always, Father God, brought all the authorities and powers of this world under the influence of the power of your kingdom. Because nothing can be done in heaven and earth without the permission of Jesus. So we thank you that every rule and authority and even the freedom of man and his, the free choice that we have is limited and bound by the boundaries of the perfect will of God. That all who receive your perfect will will always find your angels resisting them as you conform and bring all rule and authority under the name of precious Lord Jesus. So we continue to pray, let your perfect will be done. And you continue to reveal your mysterious ways, both in our personal lives and in the lives of nations of the world. We thank you, Father God, that your perfect will is being accomplished and done. Let it be so, Father, between the first outpouring and the second outpouring. Let all your judgments be fulfilled. Every prophetic word is uttered. Let it all come to pass speedily, that all may know, Father, you are the true and living God. We give you glory and praise and honor, in Jesus' name. And everyone say, Amen. <coughs> now as we examine dreams and visions, uh, yesterday we examined on... Uh, right? Ah, oh, yes, I forgot about me. <laughs> okay. okay, then it's a mirror. As we examine uh, the Word of God, yesterday we examined uh, uh, some differences between spirit dreams and soul dreams. Today we want to look at um, what I call uh, symbolisms in the Bible that comes in dreams and visions, uh, which you need to understand that uh, symbols that are used are sometimes geared from the soul. But the message ends up the same message. But he uses symbolism of the soul. Again, I emphasize that uh, this is almost like a second part series on dreams and interpretations. The other one was taught many decades ago. And I give the principles of interpretation of dreams. One in which symbols are to be in line with the Bible. But it's also geared by a second point. The symbols are affected by the individual perspective. <coughs> like uh, in the Bible, dogs can represent something that is religious and not so good religious, uh, that seems good, but it's not so good. But if a person has a pet dog, a pet cat, uh, the representation may change because of the person's own soul. And, uh, so it's important when you want to interpret a dream or vision, <coughs> to not just look at it by itself. It is important to look at when the vision or dream occur. It is also important to look at who is a dreamer, uh, of the of the dream or the seer of the vision, and uh, <clears throat> it's possible to understand the context in which the person uh, has that dream and vision. So these are other elements that we have talked on in our first uh, teaching decades ago interpretation of dreams. Now we're looking at more applications so that people can apply these principles that are there. And so we're going to give some Bible example. So let's look straight to the book of uh, Exodus, uh, no, Exodus, Genesis, 
Genesis in the dreams. Genesis in the dreams of uh, <coughs> Butler and Baker in chapter 40. The dreams have been interpreted. So now we are examining, examining the, the dreams that are there. Notice there are two dreams. One is by, by the butler and one is by the baker. The message of both dreams are the same. In three days, one will be released and one will be dead. Uh, that part you can imply from uh, the butler's dream, for example. The butler in his dream, <coughs> in verse 11, he was back in service with, the, with Pharaoh in verse 11. Then Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. So that was a normal way he had served Pharaoh. So definitely that talks about restoration from the explanation in the dream. Whereas the baker is unusual, and uh, in the, ba the baker's dream, he said in verse 17, and this doesn't happen to bakers, if the baker had a dream in which he brought bread to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh ate of the bread, and he served Pharaoh, he would have been restored. But here, the baker's dream was that uh, in verse 17, in the uppermost basket, basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh. The birds ate them. That's unusual. Because bakers don't let birds eat their bread. So the unusual part straight away points to something which is uh, a bad moment. Uh, immediately, Joshua knew it speaks about death. Because the birds pecking on the person. And they might have seen hangings before. When a person is hung and they die, sometimes birds do peck at the person. So all this symbolism that is there uh, makes it obvious in the conclusion of the dream. But what I want to point for here is that the three days that are dreamt by both use different symbols. Three days to the butler was he saw the grapevine growing and he saw three branches. He is a butler. He deals with grapes. He deals with wine. So from his soul, he dreams the symbolism of grape wine and grape branches. The baker bakes bread all the time. His whole life is baking bread. He's kneading the dough, doing the flour, and all kinds of things. The symbolism in his dream came from bakery. Two different symbols, but same message. Three days. Three branches, three baskets. They represent three days. Just on the point of symbolism, how different it is for each person. And so, if two persons dream of a great wine, it might be two different interpretations. If two people go to the sea, it might be two different interpretations, even though the scenery might be the same. And this applies to both with the dreams and vision. That is what I call the contextual perspective. Uh, the subjective, personal person, the person dreaming the dream. So, it, to interpret the dream, you cannot look at just a symbol and quickly interpret. Then you're not an experienced person who interpret dream. You have to go deeper to look at the nature of the person dreaming, what the person's profession is, and uh, understand the symbols from their perspective for accuracy or interpretation of dreams and by the way, also of visions. It also affects the visions we see. If right now I will ask you to close your eyes and see something, the first thing that God might want to bring to you is a message, but you might see things from your own soul. And from your own soul, it develops into a spiritual message. God uses your personal vocabulary, your personal vocabulary of symbols, in order to bring a message across and uh, <clears throat> so we have that <clears throat> and uh, just enjoy looking at Jake popping up and down <laughs> oh that's uh, I said you exercise and carry the baby at the same time fantastic <laughs> okay <laughs>
<laughs> doing two things at the same time. The mother is exercising, the baby is having two snacks. <laughs> it reminds me, remember in Asia, they used to hang this spring and, uh, in a sarong and they put the baby inside and the mother would go this way. <laughs> but for that one, only the baby enjoyed. <laughs> this is something new. <laughs> Okay, hallelujah guys, it's right. and the baby enjoys it too, hallelujah. Alright, and I continue on that, praise the Lord. <coughs> if you can last as long as my sermon, you're really good. Okay, so we have uh, the second symbolism that I want to point to here is uh, in the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel. And uh, well, here I show two different persons with two different symbols and the symbols for three days are represented by two different totally different elements based on their profession or their soul area. In the book of Daniel, we have um, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. Of course he forgot the dream, so we got to go to Daniel to help remember the dream for him. And, um, so Daniel explained uh, what the dream was because he forgot the dream. And um, this is what Daniel saw in verse 31. And it says, uh, You, O king, uh, Daniel chapter 2, by the way, verse 31. You, O king, were watching. <coughs> wow, there is more. You can see that. Okay. <coughs> you, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut up without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay, and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain <coughs> and filled the whole earth. And he says, this is the dream. And now we tell the interpretation which Daniel had. You, O king, are a king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. Whatever the children of man, wherever the children of man dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand. Has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. But after you shall arise another kingdom. We know that the first kingdom is the Babylonian Empire. So the second kingdom is inferior to yours, and that kingdom we know to be the Middle Persian Empire. The third kingdom is the kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. We know the third kingdom is the Greek Empire. Then the fourth kingdom, which is the Roman Empire, in verse 40, 40 it says, uh, And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything, and like iron that crashes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. That is the Roman Empire. Whereas, you saw the feet and the toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron. The kingdom shall be divided here, the strength of iron shall be in it. Just as you saw the iron makes the ceramic clay. The ten toes, of course, uh, the feet represent our modern political empires, which are democracy, strong, and yet at the same time, weak. Uh, and the clay mixed with iron. So we see what we call a representation of a kingdom. Now, the first thing that we saw applies in chapter 40 of Genesis. Nebuchadnezzar was a, a, an emperor. He ruled over many nations. And over the many nations that he ruled over, he tends to build statues, buildings, and monuments. So you can see that even his dream was affected by his soul. Hello there. Good to see you. You got a good haircut. You're doing well. Amen. Happy in the Lord. God is good. Hallelujah. And uh, so we realize that uh, 
Even the imagery came from his own soul. But yet God had a message that was there. Uh, again, the same structure of a person's soul affect the dreams that they have. But that's not what I want to point to. Remember this part. Now we go over to Daniel in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. And Daniel himself had vision in verse 3. He saw four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion and he had eagle's wings. I watched till his wings were plucked off and he was lifted up from the earth <coughs> and made to stand on two feet like a man and a man's son was given to him. Now if you ever seen the Babylonian Empire symbol, it's almost like a lion-like creature <coughs> with wings. Almost like eagle's wings. So it's almost like Daniel's description. Later on the angel actually explained to him that the four beasts represent the four empires that we saw in the statue, which is again the Babylonian Empire, the Middle Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, and the Roman Empire. Four beasts. But let me refinish. Uh, and, uh, verse 5 suddenly another beast. Now, this one is the Middle Persian Empire. Se uh, a, a second, like a bear. It was raised up on one side and three ribs in his mouth between his teeth. And he said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. Now after this I looked and there was another like a leopard, which had on his back four wings of a bird. Later the, the Greek Empire broke the four parts. So even the numbers of the wings are uh, important. The beast had four heads and dominion was given to it. That's the Greek Empire. Then in verse 7, after this I saw in the night visions, behold a four beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth, now notice the similarity of iron. It was devouring, breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different for all the beasts that was before it, it had ten horns. The ten horns represent the ten toes again. But that four beasts represent the Roman Empire. And what's the point of us looking at this in Daniel chapter uh, seven here, and this is a point I'm making. The same empires are, are given different image. In other words, when Nebuchadnezzar saw the four empires, he saw it all as part of a statue. When Daniel saw the empire, he saw it as four different beasts. The message here is that not only are symbolism affected by the person having the, the dream or the vision, the symbolism can change even for the same empire, nation, or may I say, a church, a ministry, or a message, or a person. The symbolism can change. God uses different symbols for the same person. For the same empire, for the same nation. Uh, that we must be aware of. <clears throat> because even though symbols might be consistent, they change because God wants to give a different message. And so we must be aware of these things. They don't remain consistent all the time. <clears throat> uh, in other words, uh, if God wants to talk about uh, uh, the church or ministry or a nation, for example, he doesn't always use the same symbol. To the same person, the symbols can change. And you need to interpret it as the same nation. So let me show here. In Daniel, he saw the four empires differently from Nebuchadnezzar, obviously. And, uh, we know what they are because this is one of the visions that was interpreted. And, uh, the interpretation was given in verse 16 onwards. Uh, we interpreted uh, the different beasts uh, that come out. There are four kings in verse 17. Uh, and then the fourth one is the Roman Empire, which did not exist yet in the time of Daniel. But it talks about the Antichrist rising too. And uh, then the fourth beast in verse 23 is mentioned again. Then that was uh, uh, Daniel chapter 7. And let me look at the deadline in Daniel chapter 7. Uh, and, uh, 
in the first year of Belshazzar. Okay. Now in Daniel chapter 8, in verse 1. This is the third year. So a few years later, in the third year of the king uh, Belshazzar, uh, he's still living in the time of the Babylonian Empire. First year to third year, uh, two years, two to three years have passed by. Uh, he has another vision that was significant. He says he was in Shushan, in the citadel, and he was by the river Ulai in verse 2. In verse 3, he lifted up his eyes. I lifted up my eyes and saw, and there standing beside the river was a ram, which had two horns. The two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. The ram, by the way, represent the Middle Persian Empire. The two horns represent the Medes and the Persians. Two to three years ago, he saw the Middle Persian Empire as a creature, a funny little creature. But now he saw the same Middle Persian Empire as a ram, which is more pleasant looking dream. Right? The other is a strange creature he can't describe. A mixture of everything. It's almost like a bat. But now, the same empire looks like a ram. With two horns, but one of the horns was higher than the other. Then, the ram was pushing westward, northward, southward. No animal could withstand it. Then in verse 5, As I was considering... Suddenly, a male goat. Now, this male goat represents the Greek Empire. The Greek Empire <coughs> was originally in the other vision in chapter 7, seen as a leopard with wings. Can you see that the same country or nation changes in its symbol? Even within the vision to the same prophet, Prophet Daniel. That is a factor that we must consider when you have visions and dreams. And this time, the Greek Empire is represented by a goat. And uh, the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And the rest of the story tells us how the male goat grew great. And uh, it, it, it came against a ram and it destroyed the ram. And then his horn was broken. And... Uh, and then out of it came a uh, uh, little horn which grew exceedingly great and south to the east and toward the glorious land. And again, God was trying to tell him about the end times. The interesting thing here is that this vision was also given interpretation, which was given in verse 20 and verse 21. There you have it. The kings of Med Media and Persia. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. So, the interpretation for this vision was given. But what we need to study and make note of here is this. To the same prophet, Prophet Daniel, over a period of two to three years, he was given a second vision that used a different symbol. You were taught that if God wanted to show him the middle person, Panko will always use the bear all the time. So you know, oh, easy to interpret now, it's the bear. Everyone you see the bear, you know what it means. But a symbol change into a ram. Same with uh, the Greek Empire, the leopard with wings. You can see a strange looking animal that looks like a leopard and mixture of a leopard with wings, and that represents the Greek Empire. Suddenly he sees a goat. Things change. Things change. Symbolism change over a period of two, three years. In fact, it can, it can change even a period of one day, or two days, a week. And it just happened that this was one of the significant visions that Daniel had about empires and kings that has to do with the end times and, uh, and the Antichrist and the direction in which he would rule and reign. So God allowed it to be recorded in the Bible. Daniel has many, many other visions. For our teaching today, we are showing how symbolisms and symbols of the same thing 
can change by the individual's person's profession or soul activities. Like the butler and the baker, three days were used, one bit of bread, the other three branches. And at the same time, the symbols about empires or nations or kings or people or countries or communities or a ministry or a church or a person or different things that God trying to reveal, the symbols can change in itself. To the same observer, to the same person, if you're not aware of this, your ability to interpret dreams and visions will be faulty. To be aware of all these changes that can affect the interpretation is important for accuracy. Because if you don't measure for these changes, then you're stuck on what I call an oversimplistic interpretation and you got it all wrong. That's why uh, symbols uh, need to be interpreted carefully. So I show the two contrasts that from the viewer's point of, of, of subjectivity, the soul, it can change. And then from God showing the symbols, God uses different changes also to show it. Uh, we need to be aware of those two opposite poles that can change. The other thing that I want to point out too is um, in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, and for a purpose, we take the book of Acts, chapter 10. In the book of Acts, chapter 10, Peter here has what I call a closed vision. In which he was in a trance. And uh, in this vision, it says it was nine. The next day, as they went on their journey, and as the Cornelius people were sent to get Peter, and drew near the city, Peter went up on the house top to pray about the six hour. Six hour is about six plus six is about twelve noon. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And saw heaven open and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners descending to him and led down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him and said, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. It's strange because when he fell in a trance, he was actually very hungry. Nowadays, God used his hunger. So it doesn't mean when you're hungry, you cannot have vision. Who knows? For some people, the only time they have visions is when they're hungry. The only time they have dreams when they eat a lot. So on both sides, you still see something. Eat a lot, you slap at the dream. You fast a lot, you hungry, see vision. God well, praise the Lord. Most like God feed you. And then we have Peter was hungry and God made use of the hunger. He fell in a trance and then he saw these animals came down <coughs> and God says, Kill, eat. <coughs> Peter answered, not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything common or unclean. In other words, he has kept the Jewish diet all his life. Then it happened again a second time. And so this vision disappeared. Then it happened again, second time. And he says, uh, Kill and eat. He says, Not so. Then the voice said, What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times. This was done three times, thank you. This was done three times. And uh, then in verse 17, Peter was in a position which many people have when they have dreams and vision. They wonder what it meant. They wonder what's the meaning of all this. Remember the vision? Kill and eat. And then while he was wondering, the man they were sent by Cornelius, reached his door, and they were asking for him. And uh, 
While Peter was thinking about the vision in verse 19, the Holy Spirit said, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, go down with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. I have sent them, says the Holy Spirit. Three times the vision came. Kill and eat. And then he says, I have not done it. I have not eaten anything unclean or uh, uh, common in my whole life. And God says, what? God has cleansed. Let no man call common or unclean. Then he disappeared. Three times he had a vision. Suddenly, he was interrupted. As his vision was over, he was still hungry. And... Uh, there is this knock on the door and the people were asking for him and say, who are these three men? Three Gentiles. Now Gentiles are unclean to the Jews. And God was saying, and I'll go with that, the Holy Spirit said. Now here's where interpretation is very important. Because in the vision, it was kill and eat. <laughs> Here are these three Gentiles. If you misinterpret the vision, it means kill and eat. What turned Peter into a cannibal? Kill and eat, roast them up. Oh, delicious looking Gentiles. Obviously, you cannot interpret the word kill and eat in the same way. So what we are saying here, that a word that is given in a vision or dream needs to be interpreted. See, visions and dreams sometimes are very symbolic. Even the instructions in them are very symbolic. You cannot take it literally. A literal interpretation is kill and eat. Of course, that would be a horrible application. And then, you know, as the three Gentiles are being roasted, Holy Spirit said, What? <laughs> the angel said, What are you doing? Said, I, 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 I did what you said. Kill and eat. <laughs> That's terrible. A horrible misapplication of a whole vision. The word eat and kill implies eating together. Fellowship. Normally you will not eat together with a person unless you have some sort of a relationship. Very few of us will sit down with strangers and eat, correct? When you go to a cafeteria or a restaurant and you see some stranger there, you pull a chair and say, I can join you. <laughs> Where did you come from? Right? You need to know the person. You need to literally know the person. Uh, there's only one time in my life I ever had a stranger. I said, you have? Oh yeah. That was in Singapore when uh, they opened a new Cantonese store. Uh, what's that famous one? Ho Sim Ho Kim. You're from Hong Kong. It's from Hong Kong. The famous for Tim Sam. I forgot what it was. Uh, something that came inside. Right. But they are supposed to be very famous. But according to one connoisseur of food, uh, I just said it's, it's not up to standard. So it's different. But anyway, there was a long line when it was first open at, uh, at Singapore Plaza, which is uh, what it was the uh, MRT station already at Kids for the Toby God. And uh, so I happened to be there after a haircut. And uh, so the day, I said, okay, you know, let me eat something. I saw this long line, and that, that was long line that was there. But then the line became very short. I said, hmm, let me try it. And uh, so it was Ho Sim Ho Kim or something like that. So it lined up. And because it was so full, uh, everyone has, has their own table. And uh, so since I was alone, there's a man that was there. And uh, I knew it was a stranger. So I couldn't find 
uh, a seat or something, so I sat together here and said, you mind, we sit together? He said, sure, and we sat together. And uh, then, uh, <coughs> then he ordered his food, ordered my food, and uh, then after that, um, we got to know each other, I began to talk to him. And it's very hard not to talk to each other when you're sitting across the table, even if you like, you know, you just want to stare each other. <laughs> don't touch my food. <laughs> you know, make sure your chopsticks don't cross the line. <laughs> no, you're not at war, so, so we are quite friendly. And so when my food came, he said, it's good, you know, yours is good. So I said, hey, come, take some of mine. So I shared some food with him. He said, try this. Say, I'm here to try the food, I told him. So he says, you know, he's been here before. So he says, good choice. So I said, try some. And then uh, he tried some of my food. Uh, so I started first. And then when his food came, he shared his food with mine. So then we were eating my friends, you know, talking. So that was not too bad. No. And, uh, <clears throat> so it's the only time I ate with a stranger. Kill and eat. Eating implies fellowship. Eating implies uh, being with a person. Eating apply, uh, implies knowing a person. Imagine, kill and eat means have fellowship with these people. What a different application. It means go with them. <clears throat> and knowing Cornelius, uh, no, he would be very hospitable, he would welcome them. And uh, they never normally go to Gentiles in that manner. Uh, and uh, that was a completely symbolic application of the word kill and eat. Definitely, that is a symbolic word. So do not be frightened if some of you have dreams in which, no, let me be a bit imaginative. So, you know, I either use Cynthia or use you, I use Shia or whatever. Uh, so let's say, you know, let's say Abraham, you have a dream in which you swallow somebody up. Okay. Definitely the interpretation. Right. So you gotta know what it means. So, okay, what would it mean if you dream and you swallow somebody up? Huh? Anaconda. Anaconda. <laughs> yes, snake. What would it mean if you dream and you swallow somebody up? Or somebody swallow you? Uh, I, I just give it as a test case because. In all my years of interpreting dream, I never had anybody told me such a dream. So, something out of wild imagination. You know, dream in dreams anything can happen. Maybe in agreement with. In agreement with a person, person eat you up. <laughs> <laughs> Rizal, I'm in agreement, please see me. Praise the Lord. Now, to be swallowed is like to be absorbed by the person completely, which means that in a sense you lose your personality to the person. It could mean, if anyone has such a dream, that uh, the person's personality is either over controlling you or you are over yielding to the person such that you lost yourself. Interesting, isn't it? It's uh, symbolism, it can be very different. Because it, it literally doesn't mean therefore you surrender the person to be swallowed. But these are the strange things about dreams or visions that come. In Peter, it was an actual vision. And let me look at another example in Acts chapter 16. Acts 16. And uh, they're talking about interpretations of dreams and visions. In Acts 16, Paul and uh, Silas were trying to go into a preaching ministry. And uh, this is after the Jerusalem Council. And it says in verse 6, when they had gone through free gear, the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit. Acts 16 verse 6, yeah. And uh, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach a word in Asia. Verse 7. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go to Bithynia. 
But the spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. Troas was like a seaside town with many ships and a harbor. So while he was waiting there, a vision came. This was the vision in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia. The message is very clear, go to Macedonia. Concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Right? Now when he actually went to Macedonia and landed in the capital city of Macedonia, which at that time is uh, Philippi, he went to Philippi, which is a foremost city at the part of Macedonia, one of the main trading cities, a colony. And then he was staying in the city for some days. Now he was sent there by a vision. And then he was waiting for a few days, wondering what to do. We were staying in the city for some days, and on the Sabbath day, normally he would go to the synagogue. But the Sabbath day, he might be looking for a, a synagogue. And we went out of the city to the riverside, where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the woman who met them. And there, a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Tatira who worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to hear the things spoken by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So they persuaded, she persuaded. Then suddenly he moved to her house and stayed there, and the ministry started in her house. This is how it works in church planting. In every city we go, we must look into the community to find those whose hearts God has opened and prepared. And there are many of them here. Which is in Paul's time, this is how he looked for them. He doesn't always look and look for people who are praying or people who are at the riverside. He normally would go to the synagogue and he preach there. Because many synagogue people, if they are true synagogue people and believers of the Jewish thing, they will be looking for the Messiah, correct? So all their lives will be prepared for the Messiah, correct? And Paul would just have to go there and say, We found the Messiah. Then anybody will be finding out who is the Messiah. And probably half or number they might follow because they've been prepared. Now, for us, instead of going to the synagogue, we must go to all the local communities and churches of where people are hungry. And even if God opens a door to some new age group that people are seeking the truth, God should open the door. Or, or Christian, because let me tell you, in all the churches and communities around, there's a group of Christians waiting for this end time. That's why my next trip is to go to all the various churches. Then as I preach there, there will be a group that say, this is the move I'm waiting for. Here, I'm, let me go. And this is what Paul was going to locate for the people. And he goes forth and uh, see, think about it. What are the Christian churches doing and what are Christians attending church doing? Now, some of them might be happy where they are, they're happy with their, their lives, they're happy with their worldly success, everything. But there will be a group of hungry Christians in every church waiting for the end time move. When you come forward and say, this is the end time move, immediately you have a group of followers. You might say, oh, but, 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 yes, but what? But there's sheep stealing. Well, did Paul steal sheep from the synagogue? Okay, here's the thing. In the first place, no one owns the sheep but Jesus Christ. Unless the pastor thinks he owns the sheep. To whom do the sheep belong? May I hear the name? Jesus. Thank you. So there's no sheep stealing. They were just changing different pastures. That's all. Paul was not stealing sheep for the sailing of. All their lives they've been waiting for the Messiah. He told them the Messiah has come. All their lives as a group of Christians waiting 
Now, if I had been a hungry Baptist follower of Jesus, and somebody had come with some message about the walk and spirit and the revival, even if I was a Baptist church, I would start following that person. Because I'm hungry. I've learned this truth. No one's owned the sheep but Jesus. There's no sheep stealing. The sheep just changed pasture. Say, so what happened if the entire sheep? Pasture follow you, then take the pastor also. <laughs> take the shepherds or not. And then nurture them also. If they're willing to follow. Train them. Remember, we're going to start 10,000 churches. We just realign the whole thing, that's all. All the sheep belong to Jesus. And that's why we're going out together. Now, as we gather the sheep, we also gather people who are not in the pastures yet. There are as many, as you know, backslidden Christians, disappointed Christians out there. And sometimes when you reach each person, they have their circle of friends who have left church or who do not know. And then when you go out with signs and wonders and the miracles of God, people know this is God. Because there are many Christians in many churches who are looking for the true Jesus. Who can heal, who can touch, who brings them back to God in the Bible. And they are hungry and starving. So good to see you well. Now the Lord did say He is blessing you with new work and new job. Has that come to pass yet? A new work, a new job, something new that God is blessing you. Coming, okay, it's going to come to you. Okay, some some promotion or some good things are coming your way. No need the Lord heal you. The Lord is blessing you financially in your life. Good things are happening in the Lord. And so, we continue with this that God has spoken. Now, let's go back to this area what Paul was doing. Paul went out and he saw this group of women who were praying. See, these are the hungry people that he reached out to. And he ended up having a place to meet. The church has a meeting place in Lydia's house in Philipp Philippi. Now, the Philippine church became one of the strongest church of the Apostle Paul. A church that became like this partnership his entire life. That's why the book of Philippines, they have joined with a partnership with him in spreading the gospel, supporting his ministry. But here's the thing about interpretation. Did Paul ever met a Macedonian man? Remember he went there because of a Macedonian man. He didn't see a Macedonian woman. In fact, Lydia in Philippi was from Thyatira. She is not originally from Macedonia. She is a tradeswoman, a seller of purple, cloths and clothing for her specialty. So, where was the Macedonian man? Did Paul ever met the Macedonian man? Okay, let me give you a guess. Did he ever met the Macedonian man? Never. Agree? The, the, the Macedonian man never existed. Never met him. And that's true. He, there were later many other men who came. Among them the Philippine jailer. Because Paul was out preaching every day and then he cast out a demon and then they put him in jail. But he never met a Macedonian man in the full Macedonian garment. It was purely symbolic. If Paul had interpreted that vision symbolically, he might have missed Lydia, the seller of purple, and this woman. He might walk past them and be looking. His eyes are fixed. Where's the man? Where's the man? Where's the man? After one month, they still cannot find him. Instead, he came across this group of women praying. And that was what God wanted him to do. 
Lydia became one of the leaders in the Philipp Philippine church. She was the first family to be baptized by Paul in Philippi. There was no Macedonian man. Can you see that sometimes people interpret their vision so literally? When it's a symbolic vision, and the answer is walking by them, and they still don't know it. Because God wanted to do something. God wanted him to preach a gospel there, set up a base. Look at all the blessings that he had. When he met Lydia to set up a purple in Philippi, they suddenly had accommodation. Because Lydia in Philippi was a very rich trace woman. One of the main rich business women in the city of Philippi. Her house was reasonably large with guest rooms. So suddenly they had accommodation. And with accommodation, knowing the hospitality of the people, there's food, clothing, food, and food, food too. Clothing, you might throw it in. She gave them some clothing, but now there's something out. Although she does sell cloth. And they had a place to start a church. In those days, churches started at home. They have a meeting place in the home of Lydia. And number four, they had a core group. Because these four, the group of people that Paul ministered to. And uh, then every day, they still went out to the place where the women used to pray by the riverside. So they continued the same meeting. Because that is where a group of other business women and other trace women also come by. So they continue to reach out to the same group of Lydia's contacts. And in that group there, in verse 16, when they went to prayer, there happened to be a slave girl possessed by a spirit of divination who brought her master's much profit by fortune telling. I then she keep on announcing, these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us a way of salvation. And she did this for many days until Paul got anointed and then Paul cast a demon out. And when she came out and the master saw that the prophet was gone, because they are using her for fortune telling, <coughs> they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace and before the magistrates, and then they say in verse 20, These men being Jews exceedingly troubled our city, and uh, they were beaten with rods, their clothing was torn, and they laid many stripes on them, verse 23, cast them into prison, and uh, put their feet in stocks. This was illegal to do to a Roman citizen. But in verse 25, at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. See, they were not discouraged. They knew God sent them there. And in a time of persecution and adversity, because they cast out a demon, they continued to worship. And they sang and they prayed, they sang and they prayed. And all the prisoners in verse 25 were listening to them. Suddenly they got prison evangelism. I would say the prisoners could not escape. <laughs> Captive audience. And uh, so they had to, they had to see hear them anyway. Say, so these are strange group of prisoners and come here singing. And there was a great earthquake. And every, the doors were open and everyone changed to a loose. Everyone was so shocked, no prisoner escaped. And the keeper of the prison, a from from sea, saw the prison not open. Ah, he was in a panic because in those days, he would straight away be executed. His life was gone. And so, he wanted to kill himself rather than be killed. And when he was about to kill himself, Paul says, Do yourself no harm. We are all here. For well, none of the prisoners escaped. Say, what happened? Could be Paul singing. I did they love you so much when the doors open and say, Hey, let's remain here. And then one more song. No, no, they were all shocked and stunned. Because everyone knew it was related to the city. It was not an ordinary earthquake. There was like a spirit of awe and fear came on everyone. Normally when prison doors open, prisoners run out. 
Here, prison doors open, everyone. What are they doing? They were stunned. They were shocked that the singing caused the earthquake. No one there to move. Wow, praise the Lord. Our fine day share, you know, by saying, if the ground move under you, it's not because I played why I was too loud. It could be the earth shaking. Wait a minute. Did you see him in the vision, ladies? Or? Yeah, I remember the vision. Yeah. And the earth shakes. Nobody was moving. Everyone was stunned. The only one who could speak up was Paul. When the, the prison keeper came, he saw the open door. He, he must have made enough noise to know that he was killing himself. And then Paul says, We are all here! Well, the prison is all there. Well, he's Paul. And then when he came, he heard Paul said that he must have shut up, shut all the doors again. <laughs> the prison never. And then the door will open, and then the door will shut, you see. In a stunned position. And uh, then he says in verse 29, he said, He called for a light and ran in. Now, this is a miracle. They, he called for a light, which means they could not see each other. Why you go say you think about electricity? No. It was all dark. An earthquake. And then you want to stand in the dark. Paul might have seen it in the spirit or might have known that the prison keeper was about to kill himself. Either he knew that supernaturally or he had he, the, the prison keeper make enough noise. But Paul says, We are all here. And he said, Hey, bring a light, let me check. And he went to Paul. And uh, <clears throat> he ran, he felt trembling before Paul and Silas. That was what kept the prisoners in prison. They were all trembling. Because they heard, it, you know the earthquake I saw in the spring, it came at a crescendo in their worship. So it was like it's part of the Amen God said to their songs. Like Paul said, Hallelujah! <laughs> Who did the move when you just come at the end of Hallelujah? No one had to move. And then here comes this prisoner, a uh, prison keeper, say, ah! Paul said, we are all here. Come for a light, ran to Apostle Paul, and they fell before him. And took them home that night, washed their wounds, and uh, <clears throat> took them to his home. And <clears throat> He brought them out saying, Sir, what must I do to be saved? For the entire prison of love, you know, shock. Paul says, Believe on the Lord and you and your whole husband shall be saved. Suddenly Paul got one more convert. The church continued to grow. And he took them the same night, washed their stripes. In verse 33, immediately he and all his family, that night itself they were baptized. When he brought them into his house, he set food before them, he rejoiced, hallelujah! And uh, he was saved, everyone was saved, prisoners were still in prison. <laughs> and the next day, the magician sent the officers and let this man go. That was when Paul says, we are Roman citizens. And they were all very frightened. But 
Paul never met the Macedonian man. He flew along, he said he met a woman, a seller of purple. He has a house to stay in, he has food, he has a church base. And now he also has added more, more people. He continued the prayer meeting. Now the whole prison was there. I'm sure the prisoners will be touched by the Lord too. With the prison keeper now born again. <coughs> the church grew. Until actually a lot of the prominent people in the city came to know the Lord. They went out of the prison, went into the house of Lydia, and when they seen the brethren, encouraged them, set up the church, and then they departed. So they finished the whole ministry. Where was the Macedonian man? Never met such a man. He was just a full symbol. Can you see that sometimes we don't understand the symbolism of visions? And it comes to pass without us even knowing it came to pass. Because we're looking for the literal fulfillment. When God was already answering our prayers. In such a manner. So here we have examples from the Old Testament. From the book of Genesis 40. From uh, Daniel chapter 1 and chapter 2. Chapter, chapter 2 and then uh, Daniel chapter 7. And then we also have uh, Acts chapter 10, we have Acts chapter 16. <clears throat> In all this, and you look at the law of interpretation and application, that when a vision has uh, dreams and symbolism, you have to interpret the symbolism that it is not literal fulfillment, but uh, the meaning of the message that is inside. Although the numbers and the details are important, but a lot of it has symbolisms in which we need to understand uh, what it means in order for us to be accurate in application of dreams and visions, visions from our soul. Let me summarize some of the points. The effect that it has from our soul needs to be considered or individual souls. Because each person will dream differently. God will use the language or the vocabulary of your experience. Symbols that mean things to you. Individual experiences. Then I also mentioned how that the same, the same empire or nation or community or people or whatever message it was can change in different forms. Like the Middle Persian Empire was a bear and then it became a ram. And the, Middle, and the Greek Empire was a leopard with wings and then it was a goat. But it was the same Greek Empire that one need to understand. Then I talk about words inside a vision of dream. The word rise, kill and eat has to be properly interpreted. Cannot actually be literally interpreted. When it's symbolic, the symbolism is even in the instruction. And then we finally look at the vision that Paul had of the Macedonian man. He never actually met the Macedonian man. If he were the Macedonian man he saw in Acts 16 was just a full symbol. And he actually met a woman instead, a seller of purple. And it's there that the house is built. So I wonder, how many people are in the Macedonian kind of vision and they're still looking for its fulfillment when they may have passed by a riverside and the actual interpretation was already right there that they were supposed to flow into. Paul left Philippi as he saw and the church was established. But at no point did he literally man the full Macedonian man in the full Macedonian government. It was purely a symbolic message that came in a vision. Praise the Lord. Now, any questions?
on these four points that we had touched on. What are the four points? The first point is so influence on interpretation and uh, varying symbols for the same uh, for the same item. And third was uh, words that are used in a dream or vision need to be interpreted carefully. Fourth is a symbol is a symbol. It might not actually appear in a literal form. And Macedonian man. Okay, any questions? Tonight is online prayer where we see more visions and dreams. More visions and dream. Dream imply that you sleep. But we're teaching on this area in order to bring understanding and clarity on <coughs> these areas. Because as the Holy Spirit pour out, there will be more and more dreams that we have. Yes. There's a uh, every different dream that you have, even though the light of the Lord might be trying to talk to you about the same message, does he always give different imagery? So if you're talking about uh, the different empires and all those different things, it seems like it, there's a consistency of change. Is that like common? Or uh, okay. So the question is asked in terms of imagery changes, like the Middle Persian Empire changing from bad to a ram and the uh, uh, Greek Empire changing from a leopard form uh, that was seen by Daniel chapter 7 and later is, in chapter 8 you saw it as a, lap, as, as a good. So the question is does the imagery change much uh, in varying visions? Uh, I would say that uh, it does change uh, and I cannot explain why it changed but it does change when God wants to reveal more details. Now, based on that question, we can analyze something further. See, here's the thing. In the difference between Daniel 7 and Daniel chapter 8, have a look carefully. Daniel chapter 7, 8, where the imagery changes, and there's a reason behind the change. In chapter 7, verse 6, the second beast was a bear. He had three ribs in his mouth. And then in verse 6, the third beast was a leopard and it has four wings like a bird, but the leopard also had four heads. And these are the four domains of the uh, Greek Empire. Now let's jump to chapter 8, where he has the same vision about these two empires, and he's not focused on just two empires. And these empires are now represented by the ram and the goat. And it says here in verse 3, I saw a ram with two horns. One of the horns was higher than the other. And um, then in verse 4, the ram was pushing in westward, northward, southward. Uh, no animal could withstand him. Then in verse 5, the male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Then he came to the ram that had two horns which had seen standing beside the river and ran at him with furious power. Now notice that with the change in imagery, there were other things given. Other things that he could not symbolize. Like for example, the change of the Greek Empire. In fact, this passage of Daniel was very interesting. Do you know that when Alexander the Great was conquering different countries, that Alexander the Great destroyed a lot of countries that opposed him. And then as he was entering into Jerusalem, history records this, Jewish history, that when Alexander the Great was coming into Jerusalem, the high priest had a dream or a vision, and God told him to wear his full high priest garment, which was very beautiful, and then to bring the scroll of Daniel, to bring it before Daniel, to show that the Bible predict he was going to come. He had a dream, the high priest. 
and Alexander the Great on a night before he entered into Jerusalem he had a dream he dreamt he saw a strange looking man in a priestly garment which was the high priest coming to him with a scroll and so the actual day when he was marching into Jerusalem his dream was happening he saw this lone high priest with people behind him approaching him with a scroll and then as he approached he got down and this high priest showed him the scroll that predicted that he was coming for that reason he never destroyed Jerusalem he knew that God the Almighty God whom he did not know yet was in charge of kingdoms that predicted that he was coming imagine the awesomeness of it and this was the passage that the high priest read to him and this passage talks about the male good now notice the details that are given now when he talks about the rank it talks about the direction of his empire when he talks about the good it says here <clears throat> In this uh, male goat, verse 5. It came across the whole earth without touching the ground. Can you see that part? If the symbolism did not change from a flying four headed leopard to a goat, normally goat would have his feet on the ground. But God was trying to show that Alexander the Great's conquest was so fast that the goat was literally not touching the ground. It was like galloping above the ground. And that was how fast, as we all know, Alexander the Great conquered the nations around him with high speed. And uh, <clears throat> then, it also showed in verse 8 that the great horn, the male goat, became strong, but the large horn was broken and it was divided into four different empires, the four generals of uh, the Greek Empire. And then out of one of them came the little horn, so one of the section. Now it zoomed down to the Antichrist, which is what he's trying to show from a different, different perspective. And uh, then, in verse 13 and 14, other things are given. He heard a holy one speaking to another holy one, the two angels speaking. How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and transgression of desolation? In the giving of what the sanctuary and the host to be trampled under food for 2,300 days. And the sanctuary shall be cleansed. We talk about this number in our teaching at the end times. And then Daniel met Gabriel, the archangel again, in verse 16. And then he was given more understanding by Gabriel about uh, <clears throat> the male good and the interpretation given in verse 21. The male good is a kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between his eyes is the first king. As for the broken horn and the four that stood up in place, four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation but not with its power. So, after having the message, Daniel, he was faint and sick, and, and he went about the king's business in verse 27. So there was a vision. I was astonished by vision, but no one understood it. So he understood only part of it. So here, an Im imagery had changed. The question that was asked by Ariel, uh, does it always change? How often does it change? And... Um, I believe that when God uses a different imagery, there is an added message to it. So the added message that we saw was ghosts normally need the ground. And ghosts normally can go places that a lot of animals cannot go through. And but it was floating above the ground. And it also was trying to show its single horn. If of course you show the back of it with the four wings or with the horn, but he's trying to show the first king's 
early death. Alexander the Great died in his prime, as we all know. So that was another message I was there at the horn that it's time to show. So the imagery can change because God wants to use something else to show the imagery. And um, it just comes from God because this change came from God. Whereas the soul one comes from us. But the other imagery actually comes from God. There's not much control we have except we must be aware when God is speaking about those things. To be aware of the imagery changes. And uh, it does change. It does change through time. Here it was over a period of two, three years. And uh, God changes the imagery. So to answer the question was, when God wants to show more details, He changed the imagery. The other symbols that He can show, details He couldn't show in the earlier one. We are four-headed leopard and uh, uh, four-headed leopard and the four wings were trying to emphasize on the four regions that will come up after him. That means this empire depended on four key generals. Raise the Lord. <coughs> yes? Can you tell us the imagery, um, I guess like for instance, uh, there's like, say smoke in a dream or a vision or something. Um, is is that still subjective based on this, uh, the, the individual? Or is there certain things that are always consistent even though the individual might perceive it one way or the other? That, so for instance, like a dog in the Bible is negative. Yeah. But then someone loves dogs, so it's not necessarily negative to them. But are there certain things that are always uh, consistent. consistent regardless? Yeah, regardless of the soul. Uh, there are. There are some things like dragons, uh, great serpents. And one of the interesting things is the seven thunders prophecy. Where the original serpent was seen coming from USA. Going to the US and landing in Spain. And the ten uh, tigers pounds on it. The head moved. And the head, it was beheaded. And the head landed on the eastern side of India, and 20 dogs came and ate up the head of snake and hunted more of the snake. And then it started running towards Europe. And uh, then, when you saw the second part, Seven Thunders, because that was given by the old Seven Thunders prophet, then when you became the Seven Thunders prophet, you also still saw the serpent. It was not a serpent, it was a dragon-like serpent. And uh, it looks almost like possible to be a dragon-type serpent. And uh, then, uh, you still saw the same symbol. And the consistency, because it was a continuation of that vision. Later, the dogs were seen to be ships. And the ten tigers were the ten horns that pounds on it. And then when we check the map, the place that it landed was Spain. So later the Lord showed things happening in Spain. So the imagery was consistent when it comes to the seven thunders prophecy. Uh, it was not affected by different individuals. But that's interesting. There are some times where the imagery remain consistent. At other times the imagery changes. Like based on the vision that God is trying to get out, will others also see the same imagery? Like say, not, you know, there's other witnesses that will see ah. the same. Uh, others see the same imagery unlikely. Uh, the imagery seems to be consistent when one stands in an office. So as a seven thunders, same seven thunders prophet with the anointing is on a different person. They saw the same vision and they continue to see the same vision. But if others see it, there might be a slight change. I show one example from here. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, when he uh, had a second dream, remember the second dream of Nebuchadnezzar, which many people forgot. The first dream was the statue. But the second dream of Nebuchadnezzar, 
For some reason, after he saw the statue, uh, and a dream was explained to him, and he rewarded Daniel greatly. Uh, he promoted Daniel and the three friends. Then in chapter 3, he go and make an image of gold in chapter 3. And there was this story of this uh, image of gold, which was uh, very high, 60 cubits. It's with 6 cubits. And he set it up in a plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And uh, everyone had to bow to it. And of course, Shadrach, Meshach, but Nico didn't want to do it. That would be Hananiah, Mishael, and uh, Azariah. And then you have the story of Daniel's three friends who disobeyed. And, um, then when... Then, that was the statue. Then chapter 4 of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar. Look at how he introduced himself. Nebuchadnezzar the king to all peoples, nations and languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. How great are His signs and how mighty His wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, His dominion is from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid. See, the king was afraid. And the thoughts on my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Then I, therefore, I issued a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. The magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers came in. I told them the dream, but they did not make known to me its interpretation. But at last, Daniel came before me. The Babylonian name was Balthishazam. According to the name of my God, in him is the spirit of the Holy God. And I told the dream before him, saying, Balthishazam, chief of the magicians, because I know the spirit of the Holy God is in you. No secret troubles you. Explain to me the visions of my dream that I have seen and its interpretation. These were the visions of my head while on my bed. It's like a, it's actually a dream. In those days, they call dream vision. Uh, and uh, it was that I was looking and behold a tree in the midst of the earth. Its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens and it could be seen to the ends of all the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it. Birds of the heavens dwelt in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. I saw in the visions of my head while on my bed, and there was a watcher, a holy one. Coming down from heaven, he cried aloud and said thus, Chop down the tree and cut off its branches. Strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the bees get out from under it and the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stem and the roots on the earth. Bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven. Let them graze with the bees on the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from that of a man. Let him be given a heart of a beast. Let seven times pass over him, in other words, seven years. This decision is by decree of the watchers, and a sentence by the word of the holy ones, in order that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of man, gives it to whomever he wills, sets over it the lowest of man. This dream I, Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Baptist declare his interpretation. Basically, Daniel told him, the tree is you. The tree is you. Now, he saw his empire in a personal sense. Before he saw a statue, remember? Now he saw his empire the imagery has changed. 
He saw it as a tree. Because it is both empire and him personally mixed together. Without him, there was no empire. Without empire, there was no him. So he was seeing both together. It has to be empire because they are beasts of the field of king. All men of animals were under them. He was an empire a king. But it was also a personal thing. Whereas before he saw the statue, which was him again, but with all the others, now he see a tree. The imagery has changed. And this is all about him. This was all about the Babylonian empire, and particularly him. It was a mixed vision, empire and him mixed together. It was a tree. Remember a tree can represent a country? The fig tree represent Israel. There were two fig trees. There were one that was cursed, and there was one that Jesus talked about when you see its fig, and when you see the figs begin the season, then you will know this generation will see. When you see it blossom, and that's talking about the end time. And uh, so fig tree can represent Israel, which Paul later on he used olive tree. He said, "You, the Gentiles, are the wild olive. Israel was the original olive. You were cut. It was cut, and you were added to it, but grafted. And so he used olive tree." So a tree can represent a nation, not just an animal. Here is a tree. Imagery has changed because there was a personal application. It was cut down, and for seven years, Daniel actually ruled for him in Isaiah of Nebuchadnezzar. So imagery does change, uh, even with, within that one person. But Daniel knew straight away, this tree is you. And said, so there's a warning here. It's a warning dream that don't be proud. Uh, here's the thing we need to know. is from the book of Daniel, chapter 2. Uh, when Nebuchadnezzar has his dream. When Daniel had to both get the dream and the interpretation, because Nebuchadnezzar forgot the dream, that... Daniel says in one of his prayer, it's God who sets up kings and raises up kings. God who removes them. Because every president, prime minister, our modern leaders are like kings. No modern leader can rise, even though we think it's by election, it was still by the hand of God. If God doesn't want you to be elected, no matter what you try, you can never be. It is still God who sets up kings and sometimes because of their position, God gave them warnings. Like Nebuchadnezzar and like Pharaoh gives them warning. Pontius Pilate's wife had a dream because he was dealing with the king of kings and lord of lords. And actually Pontius Pilate washed his hands. He did not want the blood of Jesus to be on his hand. He's fully on the Jewish hand. And the Jews said, let the blood be on us. Well, they accepted the curse. So, here's a symbol in terms of um, the imagery has changed and I'm tracing the part This pilot a good dream. His wife had dream, but the only thing is that we do not know the details of the dream. We all know that she dreamt a dream. Oops, my search engine not working fully, <coughs> but no worries. And uh, <coughs> that is for Matthew 27, verse 19. While Pontius Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him, saying, Had nothing to do with that just man. I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. 
may not know what the dream was, but she knows the dream was trying to say, don't let Jesus' blood be on your hand. I believe with all those things, Pontius Pilate was frightened. Even when he confronted Jesus, the Jesus kept silent, remember? When he, everything Jesus kept saying, until he made one statement, are you a king? And then, that's when Jesus mentioned, for this purpose he was born, and all that. And also when he says, don't you know I have power to crucify and set you free? And Jesus turned and said, you have no power over me except what God gave to you. That frightened him. He knew this was not an ordinary man. No one speaks like that. Uh, so just innocent and then innocent man and he took a bowl of water in front of all the Jews and washed his hands because of his wife's dream interesting how dreams have an effect on people and I believe the dream that Alexander the Great dream of the high priest coming to him stop him from destroying Jerusalem. Because in most cities he destroy them. <coughs> so imagery does change. Uh, for its application purpose. As you saw in Nebuchadnezzar, it was now applied to him personally. So it's a tree. <coughs> yes. We have to look at the dreams application. So sometimes when a person is speaking a dream, <coughs> one of the gifts God gave is to be able to see the dream. And then you notice a lot of things are going on in dream interpretation. When a person is sharing a dream, sometimes of course they write the dream down in the email. Sometimes as they're sharing it, this is what is happening. The first thing is I got to move into this person's soul to see the imagery from their soul so that the, the interpretation can be true. And then sometimes I ask questions like, when did the dream occur? Uh, because the when it occur will tell me what sparked the dream. And what sparked the dream will tell me its interpretation. Like for example, Nebuchadnezzar, do you know why he has a dream of the statue? He was, before he slept that night, he was wondering, of all the nights, he slept many nights on his nice, luxurious, and emperor's bed. But that night as he was sleeping, he was wondering, I wonder what will happen after my empire goes. That night he wondered, and you saw in the book of Daniel chapter 2, in the lineage of the two, it tells you the background of what sparked the dream. So it says, uh, <clears throat> that was in the second year of his reign, and he had dreams and his spirit was troubled. It, the dream so troubled him that he needed interpretation, but he didn't know what was the, what was the dream, he forgot the dream. And Daniel had both the dream. And by the way, chapter Daniel chapter chapter 2 is the passage where I quote just now since we are on it. In verse 21, God changes the times and seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. So all glory belongs to him. So when, when uh, Daniel was interpreting, he even tell him why the dream occurred. Look at verse 29. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. After your time. So he had this dream. His second dream he had was because he had grown too proud. 
I remember, although it's a message dream, it came from his soul. It was his soul that grew to a mighty dream, became too proud. And the watchers were saying, if he grew too proud, chop it down. Or humble him. So that his empire can last longer. Otherwise, he'll be destroyed too. God receives the proud. And even though many people become presidents and kings and, and, and like rulers of Nebuchadnezzar, I like the part in chapter 4 where the watcher was saying these words. And you might have noticed that word there. And these are the words of the watcher. In verse 17, the last sentence. That the most high rules in the kingdom of man gives it to whomever he will and sets over him the lowest of men. So just because a person is a king, prime minister or president doesn't make him great. Because God sometimes gives it to the lowest of men. Not that the best of the men. It's just God's way of distributing kingdom. There we have it, that we have to look at the application from the soul and then we got to listen to the Holy Spirit to see what is added to it. Now, there were several times the interpretation was given. You notice Daniel could interpret dreams, but when he came to his own vision, the angels interpret for him. In the book of Daniel, chapter 7 and chapter 8. In the book of Daniel, chapter 7. And uh, in verse 15, he saw the little horn and he was grieved. The visions troubled him and he came near to one of those, the angels. In his vision he saw, asking the meaning of the truth. And then in verse, next sentence in verse 16, he told me and made known to me the interpretation. So the angels could give interpretation in this direct direct vision. And uh, then in chapter 8. In chapter 8, he heard all these things speaking. In verse 15, And it happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning. He was seeking the interpretation of meaning. Suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And this happened to be Gabriel. And then the, a man's voice spoke between the banks of the U line and called. And said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood. And then Gabriel said, Understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. Our time, our end time. And then he says in verse 19, Look, I am making known to you what will happen in the latter time of the indignation. He explained about the Medio Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, the Little Horn, and everything, and about the Antichrist. So here's the thing. All interpretation comes from the Holy Spirit. Although here the angels are speaking, when angels speak, they speak through the Holy Spirit. You remember how in Acts chapter 10, it was an angel who appeared to Cornelius, and says, and I'll go and send for a man called Peter. He will tell you the way of salvation. And then later Peter had a vision and the Holy Spirit says, there are three men that come, go with them, I send them. So angels are flowing under the direct authority of the Holy Spirit. And take it that when angels interpret and speak, it was the Holy Spirit. Which comes down to where we are today, where we have the Holy Spirit. All interpretation comes from the Spirit of Truth, the Holy Spirit. So while you, although we study these laws, these principles I gave are to make you aware.
There is no way I could say you could use these and then use your mind and your IQ to interpret dreams and vision after this. No way. You will still need the Holy Spirit to tell you the interpretation. But knowing these laws guide you in the right direction for the Holy Spirit to give you interpretation. So all interpretation still comes from the Holy Spirit. <coughs> While being aware of these laws, yes. Is there any Question is asked when the dreams are in different color, gray scales, different colors, and all that. Yes, there is. Everything has a cause and everything has a message. So is it consistent? Like every time you have a dream, gray scale, it's this specific thing. Or Not always, <laughs> also. Even that changes. But uh, color dreams or monotone colors, monochrome dream, black and white dreams. I don't know what's really black and white, like, I think my dreams are in colors, vision colors, but occasionally you might see visions in a monocolor. They also have a message. Every nuance has a message. Yes? How do you figure out what the color means in context? Because, like, for instance, uh, a red dragon in comparison to a white dragon. Gray smoke compares to black smoke, or uh, you know, a red horse, white horse. Okay. Like, is that subjective to the individual, or is the color subjected to parts of all? Okay, there's a question about colors. Red horse, black horse, uh, and uh, or red dragon or white dragon. Uh, the colors uh, are not so much subjected by the individual. They are more subjected to the laws of the Bible colors. So the colors will be exactly like the Bible. Red, as cause you know, the red horse in the book of Revelation was war. But red at the same time is a symbol of life. Blood is red. And um, so it took us some time to come up with the color schemes. But our final color scheme was when we were talking about the 12 glories. And that was when we finally put together all the color schemes. It took a while for us, but as you can see, it was not easy trying to classify the colors. But uh, we have more or less been able to classify the colors through time as you look at the Bible. Like you notice there's a consistency. Jesus had a purple robe, and Lydia had that purple, cellar purple, and uh, then there is the bluish color and reddish color and purplish color in the uh, colors of the tabernacle of Moses. Uh, Priestly garment had the bluish background thing. And so there were all these colors that were consistent. So there is a consistency of colors in the Bible. And the colors very rarely, I wouldn't say none, but very rarely would be affected by the soul. Okay. Uh, this is from Chris Acevota. Uh, how do I interpret a dream in which someone scary or threatening comes between somebody I was courting and now also in marriage? Is it insecurity or about something that I lack? Um, any sense after the dream? Uh, they are parted away. Okay, so we have from someone online a dream in which a person was courting someone and someone comes in between them, correct? Okay, so as usual, I will look at the occasion of the dream. Because as I hear the interpretation, I will listen to the Holy Spirit. So before I could interpret something, the Holy Spirit will whisper and say, look for the time it occurred. So, if the time it occurred was during a difficulty period in a relationship, or and then depending on who that person is representing, then it could be a soul dream, which a person is having a difficulty in reaching out to his loved ones, 
I'm finding all these blockages. And the Lord is saying, you got to pray through to overcome all those things. And, uh, and I would not know this person well enough to be able to say whether this was God's will or not God's will. And uh, so not being able to tell that at the moment unless I know more of the soul of this person. Then I would say, uh, whatever blockage there is, it implies that uh, at the moment it implies it could be a soul dream that such a thing does occur and the person saw it in a dream and it just needs that the emotion needs to be clear until there is no more blockage or unforgiveness. The fact that this person sees this blockage as anger shows that this person is aware that people are angry. So his reaction to the anger is coming up in a dream and he need to pray through until the reaction of people's anger does not affect him. As you know, each one of us are individuals. Some of us are more affected by what people do and react. I'm one of those who don't care how people react or what people do. I will do what I know is right in my heart and what I, know, I will do what God tells me to do. Once I know what God tells me to do, no demon or human can stop me. That is my character. I'm not affected by whether people reject me, accept me, persecute me, or adulate me. So, but some people are affected by what people think of them. In fact, I find most people are affected by what people think of them. So before they do something, say, what will people say, what people do? You know? uh, and so, uh, if this person is among those, then this person needs to grow to the stage of finding out God's will. Once you know what God's will is, and once your loved one know what God's will is, then it's always just pray through them and God's will is fulfilled. Don't worry about whether people are angry or not. Because people will always be angry somewhere, someplace. People will always reject somewhere, someplace. And if we grow mature and old enough in life, we realize this. You can never please everybody all the time. There will be some people who will be displeased by whatever you do. No matter how you try to cater for everyone, some people will still never be happy. So in the end, the only happiness you can find is to walk with God's perfect will. And just be happy there. And it's only when we reach heaven, where all the people who are not walking with God are gone, then everybody is happy with God's will. And then 100% of people will always be pleased for what we start. But as long as we are on earth, it's most important for us to learn. And I would say that is a measure of person's maturity. Like, uh, one of the me uh, measurements of maturity is how affected are you by what people think? If you are, you haven't grown up in your childhood station. You're still a spiritual baby. When you're a spiritual young man or spiritual uh, old, older man or mature person, you are only concerned for one opinion, the opinion of God. You're not affected by any other opinion anymore. But most people are still in their childhood stage. They are concerned about what people think. And, uh, so, that's, uh, that's that part. See, and you can see it's quite complex in interpreting a, a dream. So, when I try to interpret that, I try to discern the maturity of this person. Where are you? So, if you are at a level where you are affected by what people think, it is a soul dream. If you're in a level where you're not affected by what people think, it could be a spiritual dream where the opposition could be the enemy. But provided that was God's will. So you can see different perspective changes the interpretation. It's not as simple as we think. Yeah. That's interesting. Though. Yes. So, in the Bible, don't you represent something that's not good, right? Yes, based on Galatians. But sometimes as your soul can, can influence that, you can love God's will for that. Yeah. So what if, what if you're having a dream, and you have a dream with a dog in it, but you're not necessarily, maybe you're not necessarily affected by animals, really, but in the dream, you're utilizing the dog in a way that is not attacking you or being then would you go with the 
Okay, so the question is asked about dogs. If we have no direct relationship with the animals, and yet everyone has a default mode. So some people like dogs, some people like cats, and um, then uh, some people like animals. I know you don't like squirrel. <laughs> so, <laughs> but then after that you got squirrel anointing. <laughs> so, uh, it's funny that every one of us have a relation, even though before I had dogs, because of my kids, my kids love dogs and animals. Um, but as usual, the kids want the dogs, but you end up taking care of the dogs. They enjoy the dogs, but I end up having a you know, close relation with the dogs. And, uh, but my daughter loves animals, and she now has two cats. And uh, uh, so, even though in those days, though I don't have a relationship with animals, I have love animals. So if I had a dream of animals, it would be influenced even by my default mode. And so everyone has a default. Uh, now, who will say who is afraid of chicken? Does someone remember? In our circle. Yeah, I just don't remember. Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, I, I remember. I remember, and we were all joking about it. And, uh, so, now if that person dream of chicken, it definitely would be the soul. But, um, uh, but it's funny that you can like dogs, and then God can use dogs in a biblical symbolism. But you will see a different dog. Like for example, if I have dreams where I see my favorite dog, which is Mozart, who is in heaven right now, then uh, I know it's him. But when God wants to show me the religious dogs in, in uh, Galatians 6, go use different type of dogs. That would be strange, but he does that. I have a dream sent from Angie. Angie? Angie one. Gonzalez? Angie from Houston, yeah. Ah, from Houston, okay. Okay, <laughs> Angie. Wow, okay, this looks like a thing. Oh, by the way, before I answer this, do you actually like dogs? Uh, because there's some issues with dogs. Okay, so here's here's my uh, here's my kind of like I like them, I don't like them. I like other people's dogs because I don't have to take care of them. Okay. But I when I was younger, I loved dogs, but like okay. I just don't have time, so it's more of a okay. <laughs> That's like both sides. All right. So these engines. I was on the black porch of what was supposedly to be my house, only it didn't look exactly like my house. But I knew that it was my house. I was standing on a black porch with my husband, nephew, his wife, my daughter, my daughter's best friend, her friend's little sister, Ollie. The dream seemed to be in black and white because everything looked grey, gloomy and dark. We were all on the back porch looking up at the sky because there was a lightning storm. As I look around, I could see that there was no grass on the ground, just dirt, and the trees didn't have any leaves. They looked like they were dead. I remember saying, it is the end time. Now, this part really tells you the dream interpretation. In the dream, she said, it is the end times. And uh, let me continue. The sky was so dark and cloudy with clouds that seemed to be rolling on top of each other. Random lightning would shoot up and hit the ground. Every time that the lightning hit the ground, it implanted something like a small black round thing into the ground. I could sense that whatever it was implanting was not good. Then all of a sudden, a lightning struck on the ground of my backyard and implanted one of those black things into the ground. Then all of a sudden, the little girl ran to pick up what looked like a black rock. I yelled at her to drop it and she really threw it into our house. We all ran to see where it landed. It was on the floor of one of our black back bedrooms. Right away, our cat ran to it and picked it up. But as soon as she picked it up, she turned into a squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> That's just for you. 
I started digging into the floor, in the ground, in the room. The floor seemed to be ground with dirt and planted it into the floor of our room. As I was looking at the squirrel burying the black thing into the ground in the room of my house, I felt excitement because I came to this understanding and I said, Oh, it's not a time to sow, it's a time to reap. We need to sell our house. Then we all heard a loud lightning strike the ground. It seemed to be close to my house because it was so loud. We all ran into the nearest closet to hide. Then I woke up. I prayed, asked God to help me understand uh, his dream. And then uh, you either wanted to be a squirrel or you're a squirrel. <laughs> that was you. Okay. Definitely, I don't remember you wanting to be a squirrel. Okay. I said, you remember my dream. I wonder if you are the squirrel in my dream. <laughs> I know, in this case, the squirrel is not uh, Aruel. Uh, the squirrel just happened to be an animal that has the ability to dig and bury things in the background. But this dream is easy to interpret. It's about the end time. And uh, this dream occur when you were praying about your financial situation, uh, Angie, and you were talking about planning your things, including your house and all those things. And this dream was given to you to tell you that you have to one day be prepared to sell your house and move. And that whatever you're planning now, whatever you're doing now, you need to be aware that you are only got five to six years. So be aware of that that there is a time coming when you got to sell your house. Because the end time has to do with the Exodus. And around 2021, 20, 2022, is a time when we were called on the Exodus, and uh, Aruel would be the first to move, and that would be the beginning of the Exodus, when people the Exodus out of the USA. There will be some people who believe that they should remain, but uh, that's up to them. And, and they might have a message for the for the five sections that will take place in the civil war. They might have a role to play. But generally, most people will be asked to move. And uh, so it's saying that whatever financial planning you're planning now, be prepared that you have to plan in selling your house uh, at least close to the time of the exodus. And uh, don't commit to anything is more than six years. So this dream is reminding you about number one, end times. Number two, it has to do with your financial situation. Now it might actually be involving your house or your whole financial planning. While you're in your financial planning, you must remember in USA you go only about six years at most. Yes. I have two questions. One for, from Peter from Malaysia, um, how to differentiate dream? Is it from God, enemy, or ourselves? That's number one. And number two is from Mar Martin. Uh, from Martin is, uh, what's the meaning of one who often dreams? He either rescue people, like family members, or has all kinds of, of Adventure, similar to superhero. Okay. Adventure. Okay. Where one is the hero. Okay. On the first one, to differentiate between dreams from God, from oneself, or the devil. Firstly, we eliminate the devil. In our walk with God, the devil should not be able to give us dreams, and uh, it should not be able to get through. If we ever get through, just you know. You will know, I mean, it's all full of fear and torment and all those things. And uh, just ask God to cover whatever open doors that you have. And then, uh, but Jesus should stop it and pro do protection around you. Uh, but dreams can be either from God or from the soul, and both are fine. Because if they are from the soul, they reveal the progression of our soul. If they are from God, there's a message that we need to get. And then in terms of Martin, uh, in terms of saving people or being a superhero, it has to do with evangelism. Those are dreams that have to do with evangelism. Talking about evangelism and anointing that is coming. 
to save people, uh, to do a work in their lives in which to help them. A hero helps people. Yeah. Pastoral work, evangelism work. Yes. <coughs> Because you brought up about the fact that you want, if they were going to take them or not, how do you, um, whenever a child is having a dream, differentiate between whenever the Lord is showing you that you don't understand and so it scares them and between when they're having nightmares? Okay. Uh, for children, there is a level of protection. And as you know, I've seen angels, when children are up to the age of um, accountability, even though they have one constant guardian angel that's with them their entire life, watching them, they are assigned specialized angels who watch over children. And then when the children reach the age of accountability, the different set of angels come, bring them to the teenage years before they are mature, then the final guardian angel reveals itself. And um, for children, generally, God would not give them like. Like for example, Daniel's types of vision and dream, they're very frightening. Like it's almost like a nightmare when you look at all those animals, you know, horrible creatures and all that, the four empires, uh, four creatures that represent. It is like a, it is a horror movie and uh, you might get up very frightened. God normally don't give those to children yet. So for most children, uh, if they get frightened or disturbing dreams, it's usually the enemy. And uh, how you can prevent them is to, uh, is to prevent them from having input in the first place. And uh, frighten, uh, the open door for, for enemies' dreams to enter the dream life of children is usually through TV or video games. And uh, uh, all children should be protected from wrong input for the first five years of their life maybe more, so that they are not exposed to things until they got more grounding in the world. Uh, with my own children, I used to tell them, if, uh, in fact, they never see non-Christian TV, they only see Christian videos, or Christian, for the first part of their life. And then we know you cannot hide it permanently from them, because otherwise they grow up without some of the things that their schoolmates will talk about. And so, but after a certain age, uh, after five, we let them watch whatever they want, but we say this, uh, you need to watch one hour of Christian things, a Christian TV thing, like, uh, there are a lot of, like, you know, veggie tales or whatever. Uh, every hour you watch that, you watch one hour of this. And they still like it because it's still cartoon and all those things. And um, then as they grow stronger and stronger in the Lord, then they can handle more things. Uh, more frightening stuff, and they, so they're not frightened anymore. Uh, and um, then, uh, in the end, um, if we expose children too young, before certain age, uh, to frightening things, it can come in disturbing dreams. Like first time they encounter fearful sight, fearful things, uh, or horrible looking things. Uh, that they are, their spirits are still very young. So the first five years of a child is very important. Spiritualize them first and uh, expose them only to the thing. Then as they grow up, you begin to expose them more and more. By the time they go to university, and when my children went to university, I sat down with them and told them this. I said, look, uh, because they've been to Christian school and, uh, and all their life until year 12, uh, this pre-U for us in, uh, in Australia. And then, uh, because it was Christian school, the teachers more or less still believe in the Lord. I uh, still have Jesus Christ uh, in, their, in their perspective. Uh, then when they went to university, it's different. Uh, I told them, I said, look, uh, you might now have teachers who don't believe in God. And so not everything the teacher speaks is now right. You get to question everything by the things that you learn as a Christian. Uh, and, uh, so you slowly expose them and allow them to be exposed. So once they grow to your adult, because they're on their own, and they can make their own decisions. So we, gra we give them a gradual exposure. Uh, but some Christians overprotect and zero exposure. Uh, we are not the Amish. Okay, that would be too extreme. Uh, some Christians bring their kids like the Amish. We have to gradually expose them. Uh, which is interesting because my children would be 
Like, do you know they have a Christian version of Mother Goose and a Christian version of um, of fairy tales? Uh, instead of like three blind mice, three blind mice, the children will say three kind mice, three kind mice. You know, so they have a Christian version. So by the time they learn the talk, they say, hey, we call our own version. And uh, so there's a Christian mother goose, uh, uh, and uh, there's a Christian fairy tales called Humpty Dumpty. Uh, and Humpty Dumpty broke, and then how uh, through Jesus he got repaired. And uh, so there are Christian cartoons, and all those children are exposed to all this. And I'm sure they are around, and they call them like Christian fairy tales. On, uh, so the fairy tales made in the Christian version, teaching Christian principles. Then as they grew, I did not shield them from other things. Like there, uh, there was a church reaction to Harry Potter and all those things. And then my view was this. I said, look, we grew up with fairy tales, right? Witches, warlords, and Grimm's fairy tales, remember? And all these fairy tales. Harry Potter is just a new fairy tale told to a new group of children. So children should be able to differentiate uh, those things and uh, to see good from evil and all those things. And so, uh, and so they were not like secluded. They might watch it and say, ah, yeah, it's just a movie and that's all. And uh, they're not affected like a whole church movement was against all those things. I think Christians sometimes take the wrong course. And, uh, so my explanation was this. Our own fairy tales are more horror, horror looking than Harry Potter's. Right? Remember those days of who goes over the bridge and there was a goblin there? You know? And all the about the witches and uh, Snow White with the seven dwarves and the witch and uh, all these things are magic and uh, fairy tales that we grew up in. But this has become part of the English vocabulary. If your children do not know fairy tales when people illustrate like, oh, this is the Cinderella syndrome. Say, who is Cinderella? Right. So, uh, we need to know this a vocabulary. Like, we know that they are Greek mythology. Zeus, Hermes. It's in the Bible. It's mentioned in top Paul was Hermes and Barnabas was Zeus. If you don't know Greek mythology, you wouldn't know this expression. And uh, so there's an age where they can be exposed, but they will retain their Christian foundation. But it's just gradual exposure. So if they have been exposed to something that frightens them before that age, the only way to overcome that is just to flood them with more of the word. Yes, the word and prayer. So you can notice it, by like sometimes uh, a too frightening thing or whatever enters their psyche, then before they sleep, try to get them into the calm stage or something secure with the word. Then their dream life will always be nice. But if they sleep with a frightening thing, it will appear in their nightmare. They are more impressionable for the kids. There's a lot. It's good that we touch on various interpretations of uh, dreams and vision to be aware of the principles. But as always, we say in the end, it's the Holy Spirit who can interpret all things. And uh, we're going to sing a simple song. And then we go to prayer until towards the morning, about five something as usual. Then we might call everyone together to have a final prayer. And then we are close at six uh, for this all night prayer. Praise the Lord. And uh, you're going to play with me? Uh, give me a D. Thank you. We are standing.
in a thousand days. We love your presence. How each one of us enter into the presence of the fullness of God. Where we are always continually here, our spirits dwell at the right hand of God, seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Bring our consciousness all day as we spend the time in your presence. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. We're going to soften the lights with a prayer. God bless of you online. And we continue to worship God. Right.